please open up to Romans chapter 1. If you're here for the first time, we are journeying through Romans. This is our fourth week. We'll read in a moment verse 14 to 38 with the focus of 18 to 30, sorry, 14 to 32 with the focus of 18 to 32. In preparation of it, for it, you know, I was reminded, um, and often actually, when my American friends uh, visit us here, and they visit various places, they drive through, they would say that Canadians are very polite and nice people. And they would often tell me that they admire this about us, that we're not as politically confrontational, we're not as... And so we're very overly respectful and nice people. You guys are just nice, they would say. After all, we do need nice people in the world. But it doesn't mean that just because we are nice people and we don't necessarily openly get offended, that we do not get offended or do we do not reject what is good and true. Because here are somehow nice Canadians we are, Respond to the gospel. A number of responses, but here are two common ones. Sometimes I would hear, you know, very politely with a swelling face, Christianity is all very well for those who like that kind of thing, smiley face. And I'm sure it works for you, smiley face. But I don't really need it, smiley face. That's a common response. Or it'll be like, you know, I know so many really good people who are not Christians. Are you saying that they're all in danger? That would be an acceptable answer if the gospel was a neutral thing. We're going to learn, as we have been learning, that the gospel is not a neutral and optional thing. It is truth that divides everything. Today's passage does not permit and paint a neutral message. In fact, the good news of Jesus Christ is only good news if we come to terms with the really bad news that God is saving us from. In verse 15 of Romans 1, Paul opens up by saying, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. Why? Well, in verse 16, he says, I'm eager because I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I'm eager because the gospel is powerful to save. I'm eager because in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. He says, I'm eager, and he says, because I'm not ashamed. Because it's powerful. Because it's the righteousness of God that's being revealed. That is a powerful message. Some of your Bibles will say for, for, but the Greek can be translated to because. He's answering, and he's telling us why he's so eager. Today, we will come to see, as he continues to preach the gospel, and convey the message that he's eager for it to spread because it also reveals the wrath of God and the unrighteousness of man. The gospel reveals so much, and all of it is true. So in light of the good news, friends, we are presented with what is actually worth being saved from and what actually we will face if we continue to simply say, it's nice, but it's not for me. Paul is saying, listen, you need to listen. Indeed, we will be presented with this very dark picture of humanity. But even so, that will only help us see how the gospel shines all the brighter as a result of it. So with that in mind, look with me in your Bibles, Romans chapter 1. And for the sake of context and the wider picture, I'm going to read from 14 till the end of the chapter to 32. So let us begin. Verse 14, I'm under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. I'm so I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. For the wrath of God is, be, is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men 
who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since creation of the world, in the things that have been made. So they are without excuse. For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him. But they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to the dishonoring of their bodies among themselves, because they exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshipped and served creature rather than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this reason, God gave them up to dishonorable passions, for their women exchanged natural relations for those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passions for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving themselves due penalty for their error. And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. They were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice. They are full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. They know God's righteous decree that those who practice such things deserve to die. They not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father, we are before you under this passage, and we ask that through your Holy Spirit that you would witness to us, illuminate our minds and our hearts, convict us, draw us near to you, help us to rejoice in you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As Paul continues to preach the gospel, we can see in today's passage, as though Paul is in a divine courtroom, like Isaiah was at the beginning of his, we will see him lay the charges, announce them, and then lay the evidence after evidence being submitted against the guilty party. Having read Paul's introduction in the first 17 verses, Paul now lays out his argument and begins his earnest plea. He begins by describing humanity's sin against God and its catastrophic consequences. So let me sum it up in the main point. And that's this. God's judgment is on all who reject the truth about himself and turn to idolatry. God's judgment is on all who reject the truth about himself and turn to idolatry. If this were true, then we need to pay careful attention to what Paul has to say in this passage. So here's the first observation that's captured in verse 17 and 18. God's wrath against, is against all who reject his truth. God's wrath is against all who reject his truth. It's important to see the wider picture again because what sheds light to verse 18 is actually seen in 17. It says in 17, for in it, that's the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So he quotes Habakkuk there. God's saving righteousness is revealed only to those who come empty-handed with faith. Why? Because God's righteous anger is with everyone who rejects his righteousness that's being made available in the gospel. So when we don't go to God empty-handed and by faith, the only thing that's left is the wrath of God, the anger and the judgment of God. Look at verse 18, 4, it says, Because the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. This is Paul's opening statement, if it was a courtroom, saying, here it is. Before the evidence is laid, he makes a couple of observations. He says, the wrath of God. Now, 
I don't know what your understanding of this is. It's important to clarify this. The wrath of God is God's anger and judgment against sin. Very simply put, God's anger and judgment against sin. It means that his anger towards sinners is just, it's measured, it's personal, and it's provoked by the unrighteousness of man. I think we often take our fallen experiences and through those lenses we look at God, the Father. We look at God and what He does. That's dangerous. God in His perfection acts. And we in our fallen nature struggle sometimes to understand the judgment and the righteousness of God. Remember, we spent months in the Minor Prophets understanding God's judgment and righteousness. Now, some English translation, uh, if you have the NIV, it doesn't use the word for at the beginning of verse 18 which is meant to really link us to the previous section. I think it's important to see the connection because the phrase, the wrath of God in verse 18, stands in parallel to the expression, the righteousness of God in verse 17. If God is righteous and holy, then he must judge and he will judge and there is wrath. It shows that Paul considers the revelation of God's wrath to clarify in some way the meaning of God who is righteous. They're not disconnected. Paul wants to make something very clear here, namely that the gospel is necessarily not some simple thing to make you and I happy because there is such thing as the wrath of God. It's not just to make us happy. Humans are, apart from the gospel, Paul is saying under the wrath of God. There's only two categories. Apart from the gospel, apart from receiving the righteousness of God, we are under the wrath of God. So if you don't understand or believe the wrath of God, the gospel will not thrill you, empower you, or move you and me. You see, God's anger is not selfish or arbitrary like you and I can respond, but represents His holy and loving response to human wickedness. We must be clear about that. There are some in the last hundred years, particularly one author who wrote a commentary that was widely spread He sought to eliminate any notion of God's personal and holy anger, the wrath of God. He explained it away. He said, actually, it's unworthy of God. And and there was a dominant focus and shift to God's love at the absence of God's holiness and God's wrath. In fact, some have gone to express that this idea of wrath is an impersonal cause and effect. You do this, there's this. But to buy that is to reject the biblical description of who God is and how he responds to sin. You see, the sentimental gospel that is frequently presented in today's time falls short of the gospel as we see in the Bible. Moreover, modern materialism does work to deny the possibility of God's wrath because, hey, we're blessed. We have all of this stuff. We're not under judgment. Interesting that it's not only this, but even those who are in the church sometimes. Uh, 20 years ago this year, the modern hymn, In Christ Alone, was released. And the church has been blessed by it, by the Gettys. But at, at a few years later, one major group wanted to put that in their hymnal. And they asked them to remove the part in the second stanza that says, For the wrath of God has been satisfied. They said, only that will we are added. And if they added it, they would make a lot of money from it. And so the Gettys responded and said, no. The propitiation of God, the wrath of God is all in the scripture. We shouldn't water down the gospel. And they stay true to the verses. In fact, we'll we'll sing this as our closing today. The scriptures compel us to see God as both gracious in saving and righteous in his judgment. Not just one or the other, but both. We should note, he says, For God's wrath is real from the heavens against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. It carries the illusion of Genesis 19. What happened in Genesis 19? Sodom and Gomorrah. The unrighteousness of man literally speeded the judgment of God upon that place. When Lot told them, you shall not do this to his fellow city men, they said, who are you? And they almost harmed him unless the angels came and rescued them. God rained down fire and brimstone from heaven upon a godless and wicked city in Genesis 19. In fact, the names of those cities to this day are a byword for what is desolate, broken, and dark. 
when somebody says Sodom and Gomorrah. But here, Paul widens it not just to the city bent on living under rejection of God, but to all humanity living in rejection of his righteousness. So it's worse than simply saying bad actions have bad consequences. He's not just speaking about the final judgment here. Instead, he's saying God's righteousness is being revealed presently as the gospel is being preached. What he's saying is the world is under judgment and is living in sin. And as we preach, proclaim the gospel, the light is shed. So we can see, oh, my heart, our lives, our society, we're living and promoting sin apart from the gospel. So there's a present judgment that's being revealed and the light is being shed as the gospel is proclaimed. That's why Paul says, I'm eager to proclaim the gospel to you in Rome, the capital city of paganism, of idolatry, of all things. You need to hear the gospel. And then I want to go to Spain from there. Remember, Paul's aim in this book is the mission of the gospel and the unity and the growth and the love of the church. So he's eager to preach. It's against everyone except those who trust in King Jesus and his saving grace. And verse 18 ends by saying this, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. It's not just rejecting God's truth, but also suppressing it from having any effect on other people. You know, the Lord Jesus shed light on this in John 3.19. He says, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their works are evil. We naturally do this. In fact, in our fallen nature, we have a built-in immune system to sin. It actively seeks to suppress and oppose God's truth because it is a threat to our sinful desire. The grace and the gospel threatens our sinful desire. Sinners have what we call natural immunity to keep sinning and keep at bay from the truth of the gospel. That's who we are. In this state, we deliberately stifle any truth which challenges our self-centeredness. So the Bible says that each of us are really and objectively guilty before a God and without excuse. So if you're not a Christ follower, friend, you need to recognize this reality. If you want to understand the gospel, the really good news of the gospel sheds light on the really terrible news of sin and rejection of God's truth. We need to see both. So let me encourage you, friend, to explore God's truth, despite what you may have believed all this time. Because what awaits you in the gospel is divine, full of mercy and grace. So seek it today. For believers, we must remember and convey God's love in light of His holiness. We must not ignore the holiness of God and just speak of love. We must not just ignore the love of God and just focus on holiness. We must paint from the scriptures the whole person of God who is loving and holy. A failure to understand and appreciate God's holiness and its implication is wrath against sin will warp our understanding of his character and his good news to a sinful world. This is why we are called to read and reread scripture in order to deeply reflect and apply the biblical worldview so we can be eager and not ashamed. We can be eager and not ashamed. Then in the next portion of the text, Paul says, this is our second point, exchanging God for something else always leads to false worship. So we'll look at verses 19 to 23 here. Exchanging some God for something else always leads to false worship. So here, Paul is in front of the judge almost. And he says, God, here's exhibit A, evidence against sinners. Verse 19, for what can be known? Because what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. The first piece of evidence is that there's a creator God. Paul says creation itself serves first and as a universal evidence that there is a God who made all things and put creation into order. In fact, he's saying creation has God's fingerprint all over it. It is one big finger pointing to God, as Paul Tripp once described it. This is why science is so helpful. For it helps us understand that there is an order to be understood. And there's no coincidence that so much of modern science has its roots in the Christian faith. Verse 24, the invisible attributes, namely his eternal power, 
divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. Saying, listen, this has been present from the beginning, and end of verse 20 says, they are without excuse. So, they are without excuse. God is invisible, but the entire natural world bears witness to his beautiful creation, the design, and his complexity. In fact, in Acts 14, Paul is proclaiming the gospel in Lystra. And he reminded the audience that the rain and the harvest, harvest witness God's existence. He says, the fact that you get rain, you have crops, and you can harvest is because God is there. And he says, don't be foolish. Point being, this level leaves all people, you and I, no matter where we're from, how much we know or how little we know, without excuse. Because we can see there's a creator, God, because of creation. As one author puts it, Creation leaves reveals only enough to make creation reveals only enough of God to make you and I inexcusably guilty for not worshiping him that there is a God who made it because we have not made this this is what's described as general revelation meaning we see in creation proving that there is a creator who has made the rest of creation so what has fallen humanity done with the revelation of God given in creation well, he says in verse 21 the following, For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. So sinners do not naturally seek to honor God and give thanks to him. I know I didn't before God saved me. That is to recognize that we owe him everything. We don't do that naturally. We too easily take what God has made and act like it's our own. Our ingratitude is evident in the way we think in which the world or somehow God owes us everything. So instead of honoring God and giving thanks to Him, we become grumblers. I know, it's easy to do that. But grumblers are practical unbelievers because we don't recognize God and we don't give thanks to Him. So when I'm a Christ follower and all I'm doing is grumbling, I'm living like a practical unbeliever. And Paul is warning us. Whereas gratitude is a fundamental mark of joy and obedience of faith that Paul talks about. So what happens when people refuse to acknowledge God and depend on Him? Well, he answers it in verse 22 and 23. Claiming to be wise, they become fools. And exchanged, you should underline this in your Bible if you do, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal men and birds and animals and creeping things. At the heart of the sinful human heart, the scripture diagnosis, a terrible exchange. Humanity has exchanged the glory of God for images resembling man and animals. This exchange is seen in the destructive relationship with God vertically. And when we are vertically cut off from God, there lays the destructiveness for our, all of our horizontal relationships around us. Why is it that no single family in the world has been left with struggles? Why is it that every family has been untouched and affected by sin? All of us can relate to issues in our homes horizontally because vertically it was and is broken. And when vertically cut off from God, we can see it when we look sideways. This is the essence of what Jesus said was the two greatest commandments, to love the Lord your God and to love your neighbor. When we fail to love God, we automatically become idolaters. Paul is saying here, when we exchange the glory of God for creation, we become idolaters. It is idolatry. Idolatry is the fundamental sin that replaces God of creation with something or someone else to give us purpose and meaning and happiness. Paul is saying that the human heart loves to make a good thing into a God thing. Although, modern idols don't look like ancient ones. Images served today are often mental rather than metal. I know how it is. We sometimes easily think, oh, we're not, you know, the East, we're not Eastern religions, we don't have idols in our homes. That's true, we may not, but we have idols in our hearts. So they don't have to be metal or wood. They often are mental first. That's how we end up carving them up. But people still devote their lives and trust in many other things than God. We often fail to see that the cultural idolatry of the West 
is no better than the cultural idolatry of the Eastern culture. We too easily exchange the worship of the living God for modern obsession with success, wealth, fame, looks, and influence. We also live in an age of unbelief, and the notion of God is so easily dismissed. There is no God. I don't need God. You know, many reject the Creator God in preference for an impersonal process called evolution. But one philosopher put it really well. He says, breathing gods there all the time and arguing against them is not helpful. And we do that all the time in our culture. Still, there are others who say, hey, I have a form of spirituality, sort of a mystical engagement with our own beings. It's still a rejection of the God who made us. So in God's eyes, they are all equally sinful and worthy of his wrath. Because we are created to worship the Creator, in our sin we will always seek to worship something, something else. We simply change the object of our worship in our idolatry. You see, we are people who desire to live for a purpose, which captures our imagination, our allegiance. We seek to rest our deepest hopes and calms our biggest fears in those idols. Whatever it is, we worship it. We serve it. It becomes our bottom line. We cannot live without it defining and validating everything we do by it. We do this in our relationships too. Without the God of the Bible, we would have no moral absolutes. And morality will continue to be defined by the majority who are in power in every culture. This is true in the Old Testament. What happened by those who are in power of Israel when they turn to idolatry? The whole nation follows them every time. The spiritual leaders, the political leaders. And same thing happens to the West in any country. So, here's a good test for us to ask. What or who, if taken away from me, would make life look like hell? That's my idol. What or who, if taken away from me, would make my life look like hell? So to some, it's relationship. To some, it's money. To some, it's health. To some, it's education. Whatever it is, that's the competing object in our heart. So an application for believers, we must prayerfully identify and reject competing worship. We must prayerfully identify and reject competing worship. We should not think that since we are in the faith that we have arrived. We're making progress. We are pilgrims in a foreign place. And we're headed to glory to meet the king. Satan would rather have us bound up with good things that compete for our worship. You know, when he tempted the Lord, last night I was reading with my children when Jesus was tempted in the desert. And as I was thinking through that, he tempted them with everything good that our fallen nature accepts. Right? Praise, money, power. But he responded, it is written. So we have to reflect, let the, let the word of God reveal in our own hearts. If any of these things are taken away, is my life like hell? Do I lose purpose, meaning, value, peace? That's the idol we need to repent of. Can I just give you a practical thing to do that helps me? Um, if you're being discipled by someone, invite them into that conversation. Just say, hey, listen, take it easy on me, but be honest with me. I do that with my mentor too. He, we think th through stuff together. We pray and he identifies things that I need to continue to work on and encourages me to think where I'm making progress in. So the Christian faith is not a solo effort. It's a community effort. And walk with somebody, ideally in the local church, who's doing life with you, and say, hey, what do you think are some of the things that I need to work on in my own life as you listen to me, as you watch my life, week in and week out? This takes us to our third and final point. False worship always leads to the moral chaos of society. So in point two, we saw the exchange, exchanging God for something else always leads to false worship. And then he builds on this. False worship always is the moral chaos of society. Again, this is nothing new. It's very evident in the Old Testament. If you read after Deuteronomy, you see what happens in the life of Israel. There's nothing new. And Romans is steeped in the Old Testament text. This is what we see in the prophets. It's no different in the New Testament. Paul explains how God's wrath is being revealed in the present time. Look at 24 and 25. Therefore, God gave them up in the lust of their hearts to impurity, to dishonoring of the bodies among themselves because they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen.
So sinful humanity has exchanged God's glory for images resembling creation. There is, in fact, a threefold repetition here. In verse 23, 25, and 26, he says, where sinners have, number one, exchanged the glory of God for creation, in 23, and then in 25, he says, exchange the truth of God for a lie, and then 26 says, exchange the natural relations for those that are contrary to God's design. And in each instance, it says, God gave them up. God gave them up. God gave them up. So when we keep rejecting, Paul says, three occasions here, it gets worse and worse. In each instance, God gave them up. God's wrath and judgment on the godlessness is to give us what we want. That is scary and dangerous. He gave them up in the lust and sinful desires of their hearts. Literally means he gave them over into their over desires and all controlling drive and longing. The main problem of our heart is not so much that we desire for bad things overtly, but our over desire often is for good things where we turn the created good things into God's objects of our worship and service. That's why we're blinded to our own idols. I know I am. And I need to constantly remember what good thing in my life have I turned into my idol? Has it been pastoring, preaching? Has it been some praise? What is it? And I need to repent of that. And that's why I need others to walk with me, our elders and others, to speak into my own life. We end up living under the illusion that the thing that we serve long after will satisfy us. But without fail, those things always leave us feeling we need something more. We need something else. It's not satisfying. That's why the Lord opens up in the Sermon on the Mount. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be satisfied or they will be filled. The only thing that satisfies us is the God of creation who saves and changes. The fractured vertical relationship with God also fractures our horizontal relationship with others. When we worship an idol in the place of God, it begins to rule us. We will ultimately do anything. As destructive as it is to ourselves and others, we need to have it and we want to increase its presence in our lives. And so Paul says in verse 26, for this reason he gave them up. To what? To dishonorable passions, for their women exchange natural relations for those who are contrary to nature, and men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another. Men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error. So here we are. Perhaps one of the most controversial passages of Scripture today. It is also the longest passage on the topic of homosexuality. So let me make a few remarks here. First, if you are here, and you struggle with same-sex attraction or in a same-sex relationship. Friend, I just want to say All right. Let me restate that. Having read this verse, 26 and 27, this is the most controversial scripture or passage in scripture today because it presents us with something that's so sensitive to our culture. It addresses perhaps the longest portion of scripture on homosexuality. So, a few remarks. First and foremost, if you struggle or you're dealing with same-sex attraction, or maybe you're in a relationship with someone of the same sex, I want to let you know, on behalf of our church, we're glad you're here. I'm glad you're here, and I'm praying God would speak to you. That you're not just taking my idea, but that you would be open to what God has designed and what God has to say about it. The leadership of His church, 
nor its members have an axe to grind on this topic. Rather, it is our desire to supremely honor the Lord and His truth and come under that. So today's text happens to address this matter. So it's important for us not to look the other way, but pay careful attention to what God has to say and seek to respond to Him. Not in what I think or what the culture has to say, but what the God of creation who made you has to say about this important matter. So I'm also happy to speak with you following the service. I hope you have questions. I'd love to speak with you and pray with you. Now in recent times, some have tried to explain away verse 26 and 27 in claiming that it speaks against promiscuous homosexual acts and not long-term settled relationship within the same gender. But Paul draws a very clear line in his argument. He says that same-sex relationships are contrary to nature, to God's design and creation, meaning it is a violation of created nature God has given us. It is simply sinful. Paul was very aware of the Roman Gentile culture, where such things were more common in contrast to his Jewish background. He makes it ample clear that same-sex relationships were never God's plan for human flourishing. Even nature says the only way humans can flourish and have children is one man and one woman in a marriage. So throughout human history, God's plan has always been for one man and one woman in marriage to cultivate family and children. So when fallen humanity keeps rejecting God's design for sexuality and marriage, God in his wrath gives us over to our lusts, over desire to experience the consequences of it. So God's judgment is on people's idolatry was to give them than sinful desires, in this case, sexual impurity. You see, the history of the world confirms that idolatry always leads to immorality. It never leads to godly morality. Because why? Because we are bent on our own ways. You see, a false image of God leads to a false understanding of sex. This is true even when you see the cults of the Old Testament. A false image of God leads to a false understanding of sex. It means that all sexual immorality is sinful in the eyes of God. Any sexual intimacy outside of marriage between a man and a woman violates God's created order, period. Now, some churches, in attempt to be relevant to the ever-changing culture, downplay this teaching of Scripture on sexual immorality. They want to just not offend people and just make everybody feel welcome. Now, we should make people feel welcome, and I hope you are welcome here. But we should not go with the flow and read the change in culture into the Bible. We do that too easily. It's happened way too much. But on the other end of it, some churches strongly resist the flow, and we can easily go beyond what the Bible says. The danger of wanting to reach out to our Hindu and Muslim neighbors, but ignoring and lovingly reaching out those with same-sex attraction, is their failure to live out the gospel. We see that too sometimes. The bottom line, we are called to offer the same love and hope through the gospel to anyone who holds an unbiblical idea of sexuality that we offer to anyone caught up in any other sin. And it's important that in our minds we see that in front of the cross, there's a plain ground. It's level for everyone and anyone. And we hold that up. Look, today's sexual revolution has gripped the global West in a way that if any major company or, or government does not go with this agenda, they will be publicly shamed and threatened with financial ruin. It's changed a lot. Um, this sexual revolution keeps changing and demanding more and more to satisfy itself, but it's never satisfied. In 2014, um, I don't watch this because I think it's too bloody, uh, mixed martial arts, MMA, um, allowed for a biological man who had become a trans woman to fight a biological woman. The fight lasted just around two minutes. And here was the result of the fight. The biological female woman had her orbital bone inside her skull fractured by her opponent. Let me read to you how she described it. I fought a lot of women and never felt the strength that I felt in the fight I did that night. I can only say I never felt so overpowered in my life and I'm a, I'm a strong female in my own right. Her, or his, grip was different. I could usually move around to clinch against other females, 
but I could not move at all. This is the demand our culture puts when we pursue the sexual culture. Listen, that incident right there seven years ago, that's a strong, trained, fully grown man who just gave a beat down to a much smaller woman. That's not called equality. That's called the insanity of sin. And it's going fast and it's getting worse. That should never happen. But we have been given over in judgment. And this is the example of what happens in a culture. There are other examples. There are the demand on pronouns. As of this week, there are 78 gender pronouns available. Instead of calling what we did for all of history, women as pregnant women, they're being described as pregnant people. Instead of being described what we did for all of history as breast milk for babies, they're being described as human milk. So 10 years ago, when we were whelping our first child, if I was to take this description and I'm with my wife, I would have to say, hey, meet my pregnant people. And honey, baby's hungry, feed some human milk. Like the, the, the vocabulary so changed. It's scary. But here's the thing. It's not just the argument against it. It's the gospel that sheds light on the reality of where we are and how fast we're getting there. The pace and change in vocabulary is like any other in human history because digital media has put it on mock speed. So when a culture settles for the imitation of God with man at the center, Paul says in verse 28 to 30, God give them up to a debased mind. It's even more idolatrous living. Verse 28, and since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, he gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. So here's what he's saying is, see, our own minds are incapable of guiding our own destiny apart from God. He says, do not trust in the mind of man without the light of Christ. Do not trust in the mind of man without the light of Christ. So these verses, the closing verses 20 to 30, should leave us unsettled because all of us should be able to find ourselves in one of those descriptions when we look back at our lives. So if you're a Christ follower, just look back. And if you say, I never did that, then I'm saying you're lying. Because in our fallen nature, we do those things. I know I did. The list of sins here does not convey everything, but man, it captures a wide range of social chaos. Look at the social chaos in 29. Economic disorder, greed. And then we see social disorder in 29, murder, strife, deceit, malice. And then we see the family breakdown in verse 30, disobedient to parents. And then we see relational breakdown in verse 31, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. If all that wasn't enough, Paul says they are haters of God. This is what theologians describe the depravity of man, total depravity. Meaning, while not everything we do is always completely sinful, Nothing we do is completely untouched by sin. Okay, not everything is overtly, completely sinful, but nothing we do is completely untouched by sin because we live in a fallen world as sinners, yet saved by the grace of God. So it's not just a sexual sin that's under God's judgment, as described, but also our greed, strife, deceit, and boasting. If we just major on the one and turn a blind to the other, we become hypocrites. And that's the danger in which we live. So the section comes to a close with verse 32, describing how people who practice such things give approval to those who practice them. Think about the public leaders and influence of our culture, not just our politicians and CEOs, but think about athletes, actors, musicians, our modern day philosophers. They use their massive platforms to both practice and give approval of it. So we all buy a message that carries a promise according to this passage, it's either the gospel or an idol that we sold, to, sold out to. See, every fallen culture will accept idolatry as the norm. Sin normalizes it by talking about it, by celebrating it, and eventually normalizing it. But we must remember, friends, the bottom line here. We are all image bearers. Genesis 2 reminds us that all men and women are made in the image of God, meaning that you and I are equal in worth, in value, and dignity, but distinct in our roles as men and women. That's basic. And once we reject that and start playing around with it, it's all downhill from there, and God gives them over to over and over again. 
We can deny it. We can ignore it. We can even try to create a whole new category. But God's original plan for human flourishing is evident, both in nature and in the scripture. When we trade away the God of creation for other gods, we also trade away the design of God's creation for an imitation. And that imitation will never last. So what hope does this text present? You might be thinking, man, this is heavy, and it is. What hope in this passage are we given? How can we turn back to God? Well, look with me to the end of verse 25. He says, the creator who is blessed forever, amen. See, even in this hard text, Paul finds a moment to praise God. The way out is to stop suppressing the truth and praise God who made us. When we praise God in receiving faith from him, the good news of King Jesus, who in his death satisfies the wrath of God, in his resurrection powerfully saves sinners, we can praise God. It is by turning from our false worship and trusting in Christ's finished work that we are set free to worship him and enjoy him forever. So let me close this morning with a few ways that we can continue as God's people respond to this text. First, turn to him and praise him because of Jesus' work. Then, here are a couple of things. Number one, we need to reconcile the beauty of the cosmos with the brokenness of the world. We need to reconcile this in our hearts and our minds. The beauty of the cosmos, the creation, and yet the brokenness of the world. I know a number of you have been to Banff. I know my wife and I have been there a few times. And it is just astonishing. It is so beautiful. And yet we come down from the mountains and we experience brokenness in our relationships. That's the world we live in. We must always remember that not only the gospel helps us to make sense, of why there is so much order and beauty, and yet also why the world is flawed. One of the things that really helped me from being a Hindu to seeing Christ is the gospel helped me understand and make sense of the fallen world, of sin and beauty, of forgiveness and hope. So we must reconcile that. We must remember that God made everything and made us in His image to reflect His character. But our sin has brought us low, has brought His wrath upon us, and is what given us what we have lusted after. That is literally life without God. Life without Him means we keep worshiping the things we cannot satisfy us. So the beauty in the world, we see God's existence. In the brokenness of the world, we see God's justice. As we do, as Tim Keller says, let us turn back to the place where we see God's mercy, the cross. When we see the beauty and we see the brokenness, it's meant to move us to the cross. That is the only place where you and I find hope. Secondly, believers must guard against self-righteousness. When Brother Vinith will pick this up in chapter 2, Paul says, hey, you who are Jews might be reading this, you might be shaking your head at the Gentiles. He says, be careful. Be careful of your self-righteousness. We need to be careful of self-righteousness. It doesn't make us take, take much for us to look down at other people. Oh, you're living this lifestyle. I'm going to shake my head at you. You're living this lifestyle. I'm going to shake my head at you. Our self-righteousness is a way of blinding our own sin. We must humbly confess the idolatry in our own lives. We must remember how we were living when the Lord saved us. You know, I like sometimes ask the question, do you remember how your life changed when God saved you? Is there something that changed in the things that you worshipped? If you're having a hard time, maybe we should revisit the gospel. But remember how your life changed. When the Lord saved you, what are the idols that he delivered you from immediately? What are some things that God delivers you over time in your sanctification? Those things can sidetrack us. We must repent of the attitude that says, I'm so glad I'm not like them. Instead, we carry the attitude, this is where I was, and I'm so glad for the gospel. And I need to pray for others and tell them about the gospel that powerfully saves sinners, because as Paul says, I was the worst of them in 1 Timothy 1. Lastly, Believers need to not fear God's wrath because we have received His righteousness. We don't have to fear God's wrath because we have received His righteousness. See, this gives us both the humility and the freedom to ask, what idols could be or are already competing for my position, for the Savior, in my life and in my heart? Today's passage should move us to examine our lives and see where we are envious, where we have been slanderous, boastful, or lusting, and repent of those things. These things will indicate that we are worshiping an idol, that something other than God has become the functional master for us. The last 19 months should be a good reflection of that. So get together with your discipler, 
or someone who's walking with you and ask the question, how would my life look like to depend on God in this area of idolatry? How can I start praising and giving thanks to God by faith in this area instead of serving an idol? This helps us move from idolatry, the over-desire, into enjoyment. Not just serving as slaves of what God made, but appreciating them in the praises of God in this world. God's judgment is on all who reject his truth about himself and turn to adultery. But praise God, in Jesus, all of that turns to praise and glory of the Father. Let us pray. Father, we come before you and we thank you for this truth. All of it is yours. And we ask again that your Holy Spirit would continue to lead us in our thoughts, in our reflections, and guide us that we would humbly, humbly come before you and that we would continue to desire to be changed. And we pray for anyone here who has not committed their lives to you, that this further reminds us that it's not a simple, nice thing, but is the only thing that saves us from sin and judgment and brings us into everlasting enjoyment and glory of the Father. We pray you would do this work, Lord, and be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray.